Hi everyone, my name's Diabutor, and today I'm going to show you how to get Eleonora's Pole Blade as quickly and easily as possible. I'll also show you how to upgrade it to plus 10 as early as possible, so that you can use it for as much of your playthrough as you want. In order to get the Pole Blade, we need to finish Yura's questline. That involves meeting him in Limgrave, Liurnia of the Lakes, and in the Altus Plateau. So the very first thing we're going to do is grab the two halves of the Dectus Medallion. The first one can be found in Fort Height. We need the Dectus Medallion in order to get up to the Altus Plateau. There are a couple other ways to get to the Altus Plateau, but I think that this is the easiest and quickest one. So we can find the first half of the Dectus Medallion in a chest at the top of this ladder in Fort Height. After that, we're going to head directly north of Fort Height to the Third Church of America. Behind this church, there's a teleporter that'll take us over to the Bestial Sanctum and the Dragon Barrow, which puts us really close to Fort Faroth, where we can find the second half of the Dectus Medallion. If you check out your map, you'll see that you're pretty far away from where we started, so that saved us a lot of running. From the Bestial Sanctum, we're going to head straight to the south. We're going to cross over the Giant Great Bridge. There's a dragon on this bridge, but you can just run past it. You don't have to fight it. And then after the bridge, there's a Minor Erd Tree. Behind it, there's a Spirit Spring that we can jump up on Torrent, and that puts us on top of this cliff where we can get to Fort Faroth. Along the way, make sure you grab the Golden Seed before the bridge. On the bridge, there's a dragon, but like I said, you can just run past him. He's not really a threat. And then after that, there's the Erd Tree over here. Jump up the Spirit Spring behind it, and that takes you up to Fort Faroth. Fort Faroth has a bunch of pretty high-level bats inside of it, so make sure you grab the Sight of Grace outside just in case they kill you. But you can just sprint past them all, and then once you get on the ladder, they can't follow you up, so they shouldn't be too much of a problem. And at the top of the ladder, in the chest, is the second half of the Dectus Medallion. After that, we're going to head back over to the northern part of Limgrave called Stormhill. Specifically, we're going to go to the Warmaster's Shack. So from the gate front, if you follow the road to the west, that takes you up to the Stormhill Shack, and then just go to the east from that, and that brings you to the Warmaster's Shack. Northeast of the Warmaster's Shack is this little plateau and this ruin. On the plateau, there's a knight riding a horse, and when you kill him, he drops the Golden Vow Ash of War which is a really helpful buff that you can put on any weapon. My preferred way to kill this guy is with a greatsword or the lance that we're about to grab in a second. Uh, if you put Impaling Thrust on it, which you can get from Warmaster Bernal at the Warmaster's Shack, if you put Impaling Thrust on it, then it's really easy to hit this guy off his horse. And then when he's on the ground, you can get a repost on him, which will usually kill him. If not, you just hit him once or twice afterwards, and he drops the Golden Vow Ash of War on death. So Golden Vow gives you, I think it's an 11.5% buff to all damage, uh, and it gives you a buff to your damage resistances as well, which I believe lasts for 40 seconds. Like I said, you can put this Ash of War on any weapon. I like to put it on a dagger because it's lightweight, so I don't have to worry about my equip load. And then you can just cast it before any fight and then kick ass using that buff. We're also going to come over to this Ruin over here. You can get onto it by jumping down from the cliff up here, so that's what we're going to do. And then in the corner, next to the owl, there is a corpse that has the Lance Great Spear on it. So like I said, if you grab the Lance before you fight that knight, then you can put Impaling Thrust on it, and that Lance makes it really easy to kill that knight. Now that we've done a little prep work, it's time to go talk to Yura. So you can find him over at the Seaside Ruins in Limgrave. The fastest way to get here is from the first step. You just head to the east. There's a cliff that you can drop down. You'll see it. There's a safe spot to jump down. And then you can just follow the cliff to the south, and that takes you to the Site of Grace for the Seaside Ruins. And underneath the ruin, which you'll see is this enormous archway thing, underneath the ruin you will find Yura, so go and talk to him. He'll warn you about the dragon Ag Heel in the nearby lake. Um, you can actually get him to help you fight this dragon if you get killed by the dragon and then come back and talk to him. And then you'll be able to find his summon sign to the southeast of this little island where the dragon actually spawns. However, that's not important for this questline, so I'm not going to worry about it right now. Instead, from where Yura is, we're going to head directly to the north, and we're going to go into this little canyon here underneath the bridge. In this canyon, we're going to get invaded by an NPC called Bloody Finger Narius. Yura will spawn in to help us fight him, so he's not too hard because it'll be a two-on-one fight. But this is part of the reason why we grabbed the lance, because it makes it really easy to kick this guy's ass. I think Yura only spawns after you've done some damage to Narius, so you can't just run around and wait for Yura to spawn in. But, as you can see, I just let him run toward me, and then I hit him with the Impaling Thrust that we got from Warmaster Bernal at the Warmaster Ship, and uh, I'm able to hit him before he gets in range of me. 
Euro won't do all that much damage to Nereus, but he's also pretty tanky, and so you can use him to distract Nereus while you come in to attack Nereus from behind, which is what I'm doing here. So don't be afraid to let Euro take hits for you while you, you know, come behind and hit Nereus with a Charge R2 or an Impaling Thrust. There are also no consequences if Euro dies here, so don't be afraid of having him die if it means saving yourself. And keep an eye on Nereus' bleed buildup. He has dual Reduvias, and as you saw, he was hitting me with Blood Blade, and that does a ton of bleed buildup, which can kill you real fast, so be careful of that. Anyway, upon death, we're gonna head north further up the canyon, and Yura will be here. We can talk to him about Nereus. You need to talk to him a couple times, otherwise he won't move to the next location, so you have to talk to him again until he says, Be on your way, perhaps we'll meet again, if fate permits. The next spot where we're going to meet Yura is at the main academy gate of Rea Lucaria Academy. For the sake of brevity, I didn't show how to get up here, but it's really simple. So, from the Stormhill Shack, you can either head west into Stormvale Castle. In the castle, you have to kill the boss Margit and then the boss Godric. Um, Margit can be fairly tough, Godric is pretty easy. Uh, and then that lets you out the back entrance into the Yernia. Or, you can go north from the Stormhill Shack, go onto the bridge, and at the end of the bridge, there's a little side path that you can take that brings you around the cliffside uh, and lets you go north into the Yernia. And then from there, you just gotta run all the way up to the academy, which you can see from anywhere in the Yernia. To get inside, you need to go to this little island on the west side of the academy. There's an academy glintstone key being guarded by a dragon, and then once you grab that, it lets you enter in through the south Rhea Lucaria gate. Going through the south academy gate will take you to the main academy gate, which is the little courtyard we were just at. And then from there, you want to head northeast onto this bridge. And at the end of the bridge, you'll find this invasion sign that allows us to invade the world of Raven Mount Assassin. This is pretty much the same kind of fight as the Nereus fight. So you'll see, Yura is already fighting this guy. If Yura dies, I don't think it matters. Um, it might kick you out of this invasion, but then you can just try again. Yura doesn't stay dead permanently. And then you can just let Yura distract the guy while you come in behind him with Impaling Thrusts. You also saw I cast a Golden Vow on Yura, so that buffs both me and Yura, which will make this just a bit faster. You really shouldn't have much trouble with it as long as you let Yura distract the guy and you just hit him with the lance from a decent distance. Once you kill him, it'll send you back to your world after a few seconds. You also get a Rune Arc, which is nice. And then upon spawning back in, you get the Raptor of the Mists Ash of War, and you need to talk to Yura over here. This time he gives you a smithing stone as a reward, which we don't have a use for quite yet, but we will use that later. And then, just like last time, you have to talk to Yura multiple times before he'll be able to move to the next spot. So again, he says, be on your way, perhaps we'll meet again if fate permits. Once he says that, then you can leave. While we're still in the Liernia area, we're going to grab a couple things to do some preparation for fighting Eleonora herself. So the first thing I'm going to do is head over to Stillwater Cave at the southern end of Liernia. The cave is located at the bottom of this cliff, so from the lake facing cliffs side of Grace, which is the first one you'll probably grab once you enter the Ernia, if you head a little bit to the northeast, you'll see these tombstones. Anywhere you see tombstones sticking out of the cliff, those tombstones function as a shortcut down the cliff. So in this case, we're going to use it to get down here, and then there's another set of tombstones that we can use to go down to the lower cliff. And then from here, we can jump onto this big diagonal rock, and that takes us right down to Stillwater Cave. For this video, I cut out my footage from Stillwater Cave, but essentially, it's a really short, easy cave that just has a bunch of poison guys in it, so you shouldn't have too much trouble in here. If anything, they're weak to fire, so try using fire pots against them. But I am showing the boss, it's a clean rot knight, so she's really weak to the impaling thrust on the lance, because you see, she can block your attacks, but Impaling Thrust gives your attacks Shield Chip. So 85% of the damage from your attack will go through her block. And combined with the long range that you get from the Lance and from the Impaling Thrust animation, it's really easy to just stay away from her out of her range and just kick her ass until she dies. Upon death, she drops the Winged Sword Insignia, which we're going to use in a little bit. There's another item we're going to grab that requires us to go through the Shifra River. So you can get to the Shifra River through the Shifra River Well, which I have a hard time saying, and that's on the east side of Limgrave. So again, you can see here, it's, you know, just south of the Third Church of America. It's right next to the Minor Earth Tree in the Mistwood, so you shouldn't have any trouble finding it. You take that well down, it's an elevator that takes you down to the Shifra River, and then in the river, we're going to head all the way up to the north end of the river. 
Here you'll find this imp statue that requires two stone sword keys to open, so you're gonna have to find a couple stone sword keys, but they're all over the place, so they shouldn't be hard to find. And then you take this elevator up, and this takes us to the deep Shifra well in Kaled. So now we're in a canyon. If you head south, that just takes you into Kaled, but if you head north through the canyon, that's where we need to go. So we're gonna run past all these caterpillar, stone guys, whatever. The ones that are rolled up into balls will explode once you get close to them, so be careful of them. But you'll see there's this golem, and then underneath him, there's a Spike's Palisade shield, which is the weapon we're gonna use to kill Eleonora. So you can just run up, grab it, and then run away. Now we're gonna go back to the main academy gate at Rhea Lucaria, and you'll see, so this magic seal thing, you can use it to teleport you to the end of the bridge. And there's also a second one that you can take to go back out to the south gate. But you want to take the northeastern one, which takes us to the east gate, and then from there, we're going to follow the road north to the Grand Lift of Dectus. So along the way, you're going to run into the Bellum Church. Make sure you go here because there is a sacred tier that you can use to upgrade your flasks. Beyond that point, if you stay on the road, you're going to get shot at by a bunch of trebuchets that are over here. So what you're going to do is you're going to stay on the left side of the road, which is this cliff over here. And as long as you stay close to the cliff, the trebuchets can't shoot you. And then so you can just run past the camp and into the Grand Lift to deck this. Make sure you grab the set of grace that's on the right here. And then you can stand on the pedestal, hoist the medallion, and that takes you up to the Altus Plateau. I didn't get footage of this part, but I just wanted to show you where the map is. So from the Grand Lift of Dectus, if you open up your map, you'll be able to see the main road here. And if you follow this to the north, you'll come to this fork in the road. There's a site of grace right next to it. And if you take the north fork, that brings you up to where the map is. There's also a golden seed over there, so make sure you grab it. I believe the golden seed is located right around this area over here. And there's a site of grace surrounded by a bunch of trees, so make sure you grab that too. There's also a site of grace just to the north of the Grand Lift of Dectus itself, so make sure you grab that. Before we actually fight anything in the Altus Plateau, we're going to have to make sure we upgrade our weapons, because the enemies get a lot tougher up there. So first we're going to head over to the Rayu Lucaria Crystal Tunnel. The fastest way to get here is from the East Rayu Lucaria Site of Grace. Head to the cliffs to the south, and if you look down you see there's a spirit stream down at the bottom of this cliff. So if you're on Torrent, you can just jump straight down into the spirit stream, and you don't take any fall damage. And then from here, you can just head up to the marker we put on the map. On the map, there's a big orange hole that you can put a marker on. That makes it easy to get here. While we're here, there's a bunch of stuff we're going to grab to help us upgrade both our regular weapons and the pole blade. So after you grab the Site of Grace, the very first thing you're going to see is this little structure. There's two guys guarding it, and then as you saw, there was a Somber Smithing Stone 2 in the chest, and there's a Somber Stone 3 behind the statue up there. For this guide, I just ran through the tunnels. I didn't bother to grab all the smithing stones and stuff that are around here. There are a bunch of smithing stone twos and threes, the regular ones, like you can see I'm picking up just there. But we're going to get an infinite supply of smithing stone one, two, three, and four. So I didn't really worry about picking them up. But you should explore the tunnel and pick them up because you'll probably find them helpful. Also, right before the fog wall, you saw there's a somber smithing stone one. So we're going to use that to upgrade the pole blade once we get it. The boss of this tunnel is a single Crystallion. A lot of people have trouble with this their first time, including myself. Uh, you see, I'm hitting it, I'm barely doing any damage, like 20 damage per hit. But then I get the stance break on it, and now, whenever I'm going to attack it, I'm going to do my full damage. You can see, after I got the stance break, the Crystallion's all fucked up and cracked. So, once you stance break it the first time, which is really easy to do if you use a Lance with Impaling Thrust, which is one of the reasons why I grabbed the Lance, then it becomes weak to all forms of damage and you can kick its ass. Upon death, it drops the Smithing Stone Miner's Bell Bearing number one, which we can use to get infinite Smithing Stone ones and twos. We're also going to head over to the Sealed Tunnel on the Altus Plateau. So you can get here from this big road. If you go up the middle of the road itself, there's a lot of enemies that'll kill you. But if you go around it to the south and just hug the wall of it, kind of, um, then you don't run into any enemies. And so you can just skip them all. After that, there's a site of grace by that phantom tree that has two golden seeds, and if you head to the east of that, we can come down into this little canyon thing, and at the southern end of this, we will find the sealed tunnel. This is called the sealed tunnel because a lot of parts of it are sealed up with these illusory walls, so just keep an eye out for them and hit the walls, and they're pretty easy to find. Inside this tunnel, you can find five of these smithing stone fives, and then, in addition to that, there's also the one that we got from Yura after we helped him kill the Ravenmount Assassin in Ray Lucaria. So that gives us a total of six Smithing Stone Fives. In this chest here, there's a Smithing Stone Miner's Bell Bearing 2, 
So if we give that to the Twin Maiden Husks in the Round Table Hold, then that lets us buy Infinite Smithing Stone 3s and 4s. There's also a couple other tunnels in the Altus Plateau where you can get more Smithing Stone 5s, which I'll talk about in a minute. But once you get to this big room, kill all the vulgar militiamen that are around, and you'll see at the bottom of this little chasm, there's a Virgin Abductor over there. There's also this statue with a glowing crack in it. So we can't break the statue ourselves, but the Virgin Abductor can. So what we need to do is get close to the Abductor, and then lure it to hit the statue, and that'll break open the statue. So just get ready to dodge, and then dodge. Once it hits the statue, it breaks, and inside the statue, there's three Smithing Stone Sixes. And on the other end of this chasm, where the Virgin Abductor spawned in, there's also this somber Smithing Stone 5 over here, which we'll use to upgrade the pole blade later on, so make sure you grab that. You can fight the Abductor if you want. I didn't bother to, because it's pretty easy to get it to hit a wall, and then just climb up the ladder and get away from it. And then, once you go further into the tunnel, there's a couple other Smithing Stone 5s, so make sure you grab them, because we're going to want to upgrade our stuff. We don't actually need to kill the boss of this tunnel, so I didn't do it for this guide, but, you know, it's part of the game, and it drops a pretty cool sword, I think, so, uh, you know, kill it while you're here. Um, it should be pretty easy to do with Impaling Thrust. But yeah, so make sure you grab all the Smithing Stone 5s that are in this tunnel, and then, if you want to get even more Smithing Stone 5s, there's the Altus Tunnel, up here in the middle of the Altus Plateau, and there's also the old Altus Tunnel on the west end of the Altus Plateau, and those are both full of Smithing Stone 5s as well. This part is optional, but it's a nice thing to have. We're going to get the Godfrey icon from the Golden Lineage Everjail. So from that first Sight of Grace in the Altus Plateau, you can just head straight south past the uh, Grand Lift of Dectus, and there's a little pathway down this cliffside here, and that lets you get down to the Everjail really easily. I recommend you upgrade the Lance to plus 12 for this. Um, you can get infinite Smithing Stone 1, 2, 3, and 4 if you give those Bell Bearings to the Twin Maiden Husks at the Round Table Hold. It's going to take you 12 of each of those smithing stones to get it up to plus 12. So if you need runes to be able to buy them, I'm going to have a couple rune farming guides linked down in the description. But essentially, get the lance up to plus 12. Do not bring it up to plus 13, because we're going to hold on to those smithing stone 5s to upgrade the shield instead. But a plus 12 lance should be more than enough for you to kill Godfroy. Um, he's giving me a little trouble here because I'm on new game plus 2. And so, uh, you know, he just has more health, he does more damage. Uh, but you shouldn't have too much trouble with him. He is vulnerable to status effects, so if you have something like Bleed or Frostbite, um, those can be really useful against him. Poison, Scarlet Rot. Um, but I like to just hit him with the Lance and Stance Break him uh, using the Impaling Thrust. I said this part was optional because he drops the Godfrey icon, which is going to enhance one of the Ashes of War that we're going to use to kill Eleonora. This talisman isn't necessary to kill Eleonora, but if you want to get that extra bit of advantage against her, uh, you know, have a bunch of extra damage, it's nice to have. As you can see, Godfrey is just a reused Godric fight, and Godric is pretty easy. The only difference is that this guy does more damage and he has more health, but you really shouldn't have too much trouble with him, especially if you've already beaten Godric in your playthrough. But upon death, he drops the Godfrey icon. For the Eleonora fight, we're going to use the Shield Crash Ash of War, which we can get at the Lux Ruins, located just to the north of the Grand Lift of Dectus. There's two ways to get up to the ruins itself, so I'm going to do it from the Erdtree Gazing Hill, which is what you're going to see, but if you went to the Altus Plateau site of Grace, then you can literally just walk straight up to it. It's just like a short hill that takes you up to the ruins. But if you're at the Erdtree Gazing Hill, which I just like to get here from, because it's like ever so slightly faster, you can jump up this cliff on Torrent, and that makes it really easy to get up here. You're going to need a ranged weapon of some kind, so in my case, I'm going to use the Jar Cannon, um, something like the Hand Ballista, or a bow if you have like Mighty Shot, or even something like Fire Pots uh, can kill this Scarab. So if you attack it and don't kill it, or if you get too close to it, it teleports away, and then you have to reload the area to be able to fight it again. But if you use a bow, then you can just kill it. And so we got the Shield Crash Ash of War. Now that we've grabbed everything we need for the Eleonora fight, it's time to upgrade the shield and prepare for the fight itself. So first, we're going to head over to the Twin Maiden Husks, and we're going to turn in those two bell bearings and get infinite smithing stones 1, 2, 3, and 4. If you need runes to buy them, I have a couple rune farms linked down in the description. I'm going to explain the upgrading process in a bit more detail down in the description if you want to read about that. But between the smithing stones 1, 2, 3, and 4, and the 5s that we picked up in the uh, sealed tunnel, we can get this thing up to plus 14 or plus 15 if you go to the other tunnels. In addition to that, we're going to put the Shield Crash Ash of War on this shield, 
Um, if you have access to it, you can use the Cold Infusion, which you can get by uh, picking up the Glintstone Wet Blade, which is found in Ray of Lucaria. But I didn't use that because I'm assuming you haven't done it. Um, so I just use the Heavy Infusion because my character is a strength build. And I'm also using the Winged Sword Insignia and the optional Godfrey Icon. Uh, and I also use the Green Turtle Talisman for the Stamina Regen. You can get that from Summon Water Village in Limgrave. Um, that's really easy to get. Anyway, so now we're going to head over to the Second Church of America and the Altus Plateau. This is just to the northwest of the Altus Highway Junction site of Grace. I like to come off the road and then come around on this cliff over here and drop down on the back side of it because there's a bunch of dogs guarding the front end of the church over there and I don't want to aggro them and have to fight them before I fight Eleonora. So once you come into the Second Church of America, you'll find Yura on the ground and when you talk to him, he dies and he drops his Nagakiba. The Nagakiba is a really good weapon, but this video is not about that. So after Yura dies, uh, Eleonora is going to spawn in a few seconds afterwards. So drink your Physic, cast Golden Vow, and then equip the shield with Shield Crash, and make sure you drink a Blue Flask to restore your FP. Now once she's fully spawned in, she might kick your ass a little bit, but when you hit her with Shield Crash, it's going to knock her down. And since the shield does 70 bleed buildup on hit, then every hit of Shield Crash is going to do a bunch of bleed buildup on her. And so as you see, I'm just stun locking her so she can't do anything and procking bleeds on her, which is just making all the blood explode out of her fucking body. And so she dies in 10 seconds. And so that's the easiest possible way to kill Eleonora. I, I cannot think of any easier way to do that. So now we prayed America because, you know, we just killed a bitch in her church. And then uh, now it's time to go upgrade the pole blade. So if you've been following the guide, we picked up somber stones 1, 2, 3, and 5. So we need a 4 and then a 6 through 10. So from the South Ray of the Karia site of Grace, if you head onto this little walkway here just to the south of it, you can jump down onto a big rock that's on the lake. You'll see it when you get there. And then from there, you can run to the east underneath the bridge and up to this gazebo. This gazebo has a teleporter that takes you up to the King's Realm Ruins. So that's all the way in the northwestern end of Lyurnia. And then this is also where the map uh, for the west side of Lyurnia is that takes you directly to the map and then from there you can head to the north to the King's Realm Ruins. That big archway has an illusory wall so just hit it and then you can walk through and then you can talk to EG the troll over here and he's nice uh, and he will not only can he upgrade your weapons but he will also sell uh, infinite somber stone ones and twos and he also sells three somber stone threes and three somber stone fours. So we're going to pick up a four here because we already had the one two and three. While we're here, we're also going to grab an item to prepare for a fight that we're going to have to do. So you saw where I put that map marker, that's where we need to go. If you head to the southeast, so there's Ichi, if you head to the southeast, you can jump to this other part of the cliff here, and then go to the lower part of it, you can safely jump down to ground level, and then we're going to head up here, and in this basin, surrounded by hands, there's the Intelligence Crystal Tier that goes in our Wondrous Physic and will increase our intelligence by 10 for 3 minutes. Then we're going to head over to the Forsaken Ruins in Kaelid. So from the Third Church of Marika in Limgrave, you can just follow the spirit streams to go up the cliff here, and then follow the road to the east, and that takes you to the Rotview Balcony. And then we need to go down into the Forsaken Ruins. So this fall will kill you, but you see there's that imp statue over there just above my head. That's where we need to go. You need one stone sword key to get into that. So there's a little shortcut that I just took there, and then you can jump down here. Be careful not to get murdered by the giant birds. And inside the cellar, we're going to grab the Sword of St. Trina. We grab that intelligence tier because it requires 14 intelligence to use the Sword of St. Trina. After that, we're going to head over to the Volcano Manor. I have a whole video about getting to Volcano Manor, so I'm just going to link that in the description to keep this video shorter. But once we're in the Volcano Manor, as you saw, there's a room that has an illusory wall that we can go through. So get the key from Tanis so you can get into that room and then go through the illusory wall. That takes you out to the prison town over here. Instead of going through the entire prison town, I like to take this shortcut that's going to take us directly down to the lava. So you can jump down onto these little buildings here. If you are not in New Game Plus, then the lava is going to make you walk really slow. You can roll through it to move slightly faster, but you're going to want to be quick so you don't take too much damage. You should be fine though. And as you see here, you're just going to head south, make a left instead of a right there, uh, you know, that I just got stuck on. Uh, you're going to head south onto this little shore here. And then there's a staircase on a little hill that you can go up over here. There's a man serpent with a whip here, so you're going to want to sneak past him because uh, he can he always kicks my ass for some reason. But anyway, so we're going to take this elevator. This is going to take us up to this temple. To your right, there's another somber smithing stone 5 in case you need it. 
And then instead of going into the temple, what you should do is grab this lever over here by this bridge. That's a shortcut that takes you back to the first site of grace we grabbed over here. So you see, I had managed to die to this boss fight. And since we hit that lever to raise this bridge, I just respawn at the prison town church site of grace. And instead of having to go all the way back through the town, I can just come across the bridge and I'm straight back at the temple. So make sure you grab that. I see a lot of people miss this somehow. It's a gigantic bridge. How do you not see it? Anyway, so for this fight, we're going to have the Sword of St. Trina and the Eleonora's Pole Blade equipped in our right hand. Something that's important to know is that you need to make sure that you're not in heavy load when you have this many items equipped. So right now, I'm equipping more weapons just to show you the difference between medium load and heavy load. So you see on the bottom right corner, it says I'm in heavy load right now. So that means I get these fat rolls. They're really slow. They don't go as far. They get uh, less eye frames, less invulnerability frames than a medium roll. So if you can't carry these weapons and all this gear, um, then you either need to take some armor or something off, or you need to raise your endurance so that you can carry this gear. You do not want to be in heavy load under any circumstances. And that's not just for this fight, that's for the entire game. You never ever want to be in heavy load. So before this fight, make sure you upgraded the pole blade as high as you can with the smithing stones that we've picked up so far. It should be at least plus five. Uh, and then we're also using the Sword of St. Trina because this Godskin Noble is weak to the bleed that the pole blade does, and he's also weak to the sleep that the Sword of St. Trina builds up. So you want to try to hit him with the Mist of Slumber, which is the Ash of War on the Sword of St. Trina. Not only does the Mist itself cause sleep buildup, but also you can see my sword is purple because it buffs it with extra sleep buildup. And so that way, I was able to put him to sleep in only one or two hits. As soon as you see that purple effect up here on his head, along with the sound of the sleep, you need to stop hitting him. Because if you hit him again before he does the sleep animation, he'll immediately break out of the sleep and he won't go to sleep at all. It's really important when you're using the Sword of St. Trina that you don't mash the attack button. You have to hit him one swing at a time and make sure he actually has time to fall asleep. So once he falls asleep, as you saw, I buffed myself with Golden Valve so I could get some extra damage. I hit him with the L2 on the pole blade. I think I would have been better off just doing a bunch of R1s. But you gotta be careful, because when he's in the sleep animation, if you hit him with an R1 from the front, it'll do a repost, and so uh, you can get better damage if you hit him from the side and don't do the repost. Because that way, you can get more attacks in, and so you'll get better damage than if you just hit him with the one attack from the repost. So every time he gets up, you can hit him with the pole blade a couple times, and then I like to switch back to the Sword of St. Trina and focus on putting him to sleep. He sleeps for 60 seconds, so you have plenty of time to buff and heal and then attack him. This time I did a couple Charge Arc 2s, because my idea was that uh, I want to try to set him up for a Poise Break, which I think I'm going to get in a second. Yeah. So, uh, two Charge Arc 2s from this thing does a total of 66 Poise Damage, and then uh, after that, you only need to do 14 more Poise Damage, which is only like 2 or 3 R1s. Uh, because he has 80 poise. At 50% health, he does his phase 2 transition, and so you see he floats up in the air, and you can dodge it if you do it on the right frame, but it's kind of tricky to do, so I recommend just rolling backwards away from him, um, but if you want to try to play it risky, then you can roll towards him and get some extra damage in. After his transition to phase 2, he gets a couple extra moves, and he'll usually open up with either this one, if you're too close to him, or with his pinwheel attack, if you're further away from him. So I was able to dodge that initial belly blast that he did, um, but I don't think it does damage to you if you get hit by it. I believe that one just knocks you down, and then you have time to recover uh, with a roll before the atomic ash drop hits you. But anyway, so he boofs his stomach out, I rolled backwards just to make sure I dodged it, and then he jumps up in the air and watch his legs, his legs are what I always watch. You see, he has them together, then he spreads his robe and his legs, and like moves his legs forward kinda, and that's when you need to dodge, because that's when he's gonna come down. If you dodge that successfully, then you can get a couple hits in before he can recover and attack you. I switched back over to the Sword of St. Trina, so I backed off and buffed it. This attack has a long wind-up, so you have a lot of time to respond to it. His left arm is how you dodge this one. When he starts moving his left arm forward, that's when it's time to dodge. So you're going to see here, right arm up, watch his left arm, there. As soon as it starts moving, like, kind of forward and to his side, I suppose, um, that's when you're supposed to dodge that one. You also see here, when you heal, he has a very high chance of doing an input read and casting a fireball at you. If you only heal once, then you will usually have enough time to uh, recover and roll the fireball, so never double chuck. If you try to drink twice in a row, then you will almost certainly get hit by the fireball. This attack is called Noble Presence. There are ways to dodge it, but to my knowledge, it requires you to play super safely and, like, conservatively. 
It has a really short startup time, so if you're doing an attack animation, there's just no way to recover and dodge it before it hits you. And so that's why it's important that you have a good amount of vigor, so that you don't die when you get hit by attacks like that. But you saw there, I was able to trade with him on that punch that he did, because I had enough vigor that I didn't die in one shot. If you've been watching his health bar, you'll see that most of the damage that I've been doing has been coming from the bleeds that the uh, pole blade is building up. That bleed buildup scales with your arcane, so make sure you're going to level up your arcane if you want to use this weapon. You see here he does his noble presence, so he comes out of a little sidestep, and then I think it's only like 15 to 20 frames for the startup of noble presence. So if you're in the middle of like any kind of attack animation, you're just not going to be able to dodge it. I saw that coming, but I wasn't able to dodge it because I literally just didn't have enough time to finish the attack animation I was doing. Here I got a repost, and so afterwards I decided to be stylish and try to finish him off with the Ash of War. It procced a bleed, but it just didn't do quite enough damage to finish him off. Um, I don't recommend using the Ash of War in this fight, because it just takes too long and he's not going to get stunned by it. This is his repeating thrust attack. So it's three sets of repeating thrusts, so that's number two, three, and then there's a fourth one that's just one straight lunge that gets a ton of range. So I had dodged it really poorly here because I was just dodging backwards, but he was stuck on the pillar so he couldn't reach me. Um, the better way to dodge this is instead of dodging backwards at all, you want to dodge around him in like a circle. So you want to dodge sideways, preferably to your right, which is his left. If you dodge forward or backward, then he has a really high chance of hitting you, especially with that final lunge that just gets a ton of range. And did you see that? I thought I was safe to double heal because I was behind the pillar, but he threw the fireball around the fucking pillar and hit me. Are you kidding me? That's why you never double charge. Never ever double charge, okay? <laughs> Here he's gonna do another atomic ash drop, so you saw his belly blast knocked me down, but it didn't actually damage me. It just does a knockdown. Unfortunately, the camera angle is really bad here, so you can't see what my guy is doing. But he's on the ground right now. My guy is knocked down. I can roll at any time, but I'm gonna wait until the right moment to roll. Because if I did my recovery roll just to get up, then I wouldn't have been able to roll the actual attack that he was doing there with the ash drop. Here's a different clip that should illustrate it for you. So in this clip, I get knocked down by his noble presence. So here it is right there. I almost had time to dodge it, but I kind of fucked it up. That was my fault, I think. But you see, so I'm on the ground and he's going for another attack. I could roll right now, but I'm going to wait until the right moment to dodge that attack instead of immediately getting up. That way I dodge the attack instead of just getting up and getting hit by the attack. So here it is again. I get knocked down. I'm on the ground. I can roll, but I'm not. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And time to dodge, right? So hopefully you get what I mean when I say, you know, instead of immediately doing a recovery roll, you should wait until it's time to dodge. Oh, there I was again. There was another noble presence into that exact same thing. There's a couple other attacks that he didn't do there that I want to show you how to dodge. So the first one is this one, his Impaling Thrust. So he can do this as a follow-up for a couple different attacks, I think. In this case, he did it on a, a third hit of a three-hit combo. But you're going to see, so I dodged the first two hits. It's got a really long wind-up time. And if you watch it in regular motion, you'll hear a noise. So I hope you heard that slink sound. I'm going to show it again in normal speed in a second. So I'm sure you can tell what I'm talking about, that like high-pitched slink sound that the sword makes. That's part of the cue for when you're supposed to dodge. So just after that sound ends, right about here, and then he starts moving his left hand while he gets ready to thrust, as he starts moving his left hand, that's when you need to dodge. So here, he's finishing out his combo, that's the second hit of it. And then he winds up for the impaling thrust. Slink, and then his hand moves inwards, that's when he dodge. The hand you're watching is the one without the sword. We'll watch that in regular speed one more time, but you see afterwards I followed up with my own impaling thrust because he has a long recovery animation. So if he does that attack, you get a free hit. Slink and dodge. Hopefully I was able to articulate that the right way. And then here's the attack that he's infamous for, his fucking pinwheel road roller attack. When he does this one, as he's starting it up, you have time to prepare, so you see he's doing it, and then you want to roll into him right before he hits the ground on his side. So here it is again, you gotta roll into him. If you roll backwards or to the side, then you're gonna get hit. You have to roll through him. 
Then after that, I'm not sure if you can keep rolling this attack or if you have to kite him around, but what I like to do is get him to an open area, like over here, and you gotta imagine, like, there's a center point in between you and him, and you're both rotating around that. So he's faster than you, if you try to run away, he'll catch up to you. He's bigger than you, so you can't go to the side. You have to run in a circle around the center point that he's also rolling around. You'll be able to see it better in slow motion here. So again, he does a startup. I'm nowhere near him, so I didn't get hit by his belly blast. But then he does. I roll as he's about to hit the ground. Now he's in a wide open area, so that's good for me. I run towards him, and then I try to get around him. And you see, so it's like there's a point in between us, and we're both on the edge of a circle and running around it. You have to kind of go, like, toward him. You have to kind of, like, cut through the circle sometimes to make sure he can't catch up to you. So you see, I'm not going in a perfect circle. Sometimes I go, like, a bit more left, a bit more directly toward him. But as long as you keep running around this circle with him, he shouldn't be able to hit you. And you see here, as the attack ends, he kind of cuts in towards you more, like you were cutting through the circle. For that ending part of the attack, he cuts in through the circle. So you see, he comes like more directly toward me, so you gotta be aware of that. But if you get hit by the ending of the attack, then that's not nearly as bad as getting hit during the attack and getting fucking steamrolled by it. After the fight is over, there will be an elevator that's just to my right over here, and that can take you up into the next part of Volcano Manor. Um, I'm showing another method for killing the Godskin Noble too. Um, so I went with the Sword of St. Trina because it's reusable. So the Godskins, the thing that they're weak to is sleep. So the easiest way to hit something with sleep is sleep pots. You can get the recipe for sleep pots in this graveyard over here uh, in Limgrave. It's on this corpse up here that's on top of this coffin so you have to jump on top to be able to get it uh and then if you go to kale over in the church of la and get the crafting kit and the craft pots that he sells so you know make sure you grab the crafting kit so you can craft items um and then he also sells three cracked pots so in total all four of these items that he's selling here will cost you 1200 runes um and then there's a couple other cracked pots you can pick up there's a total of 20 cracked pots you can get throughout the game. There's a merchant right over here in Stormhill that sells one of them. And then there's another merchant uh, down here to the south in the Weeping Peninsula. So you go across the bridge and then by the Castle Morn Rampart, there's another merchant there that sells the cracked pots. So there's 20 total cracked pots you can find and they're all over the place. You can look up a guide to find them all. In addition to the cracked pots, we need mushrooms and Trina's lilies in order to craft sleep pots. So in order to get mushrooms, uh, we can farm them over here at the Folly on the Lake side of Grace. So this is to the west of the Lascar Ruins. Uh, the easiest way to get here is go to the Lascar Ruins and then just follow the cliff to the west. You'll come underneath this gigantic plateau thing. And then uh, just to the north, there's a, a way out. You'll see it. And it's a big gazebo here, the Folly on the Lake. Just to the north of that, you'll see these two trees here on the map. Um, if you put a marker right in between them, that's where a bunch of mushrooms are. So when you come out of here, there's also two right here on your east side, so you can grab them. Then you go up towards that marker that we placed, and underneath this big rock, there's like four or five things of mushrooms. So you can grab all those mushrooms and then rest at the side of grace. The mushrooms all respawn, and then you can come back and pick them up again. So that's how you farm mushrooms really easily. As for the Trina's lilies, that's a bit trickier, because they don't respawn. So there's a big group of them underneath this big plateau, peninsula, whatever the hell you want to call it. Uh, if you come around the side over here, so you go south from the Folly and then you follow the swamp to the west, uh, there's a whole bunch of Trina's Lilies here. There's like 12 or 13 of them, I think. Um, and there might be a few more in this area. Trina's Lilies are all over the place, um, but they don't respawn, so you can't farm them. Um, there's a few enemies that drop them, but they drop them at an extremely low rate. Um, so, you know, this is like a, a valuable resource, which is why I don't like using the sleep pots to fight this boss, um, because there are better bosses to use sleep pots on. And, you know, you might run out of fucking Trina Zillies, you might run out of sleep pots if you don't beat it the first time or two. Um, so that's why I like using the Sword of St. Trina, because it's an infinite source of sleep. But with that said, if you have the sleep pots, it is way easier to kill this guy, because you just back off, you throw a sleep pot at him, Something you should know is that his resistance to sleep increases every time you put him to sleep. So for the first time you put him to sleep, I think it requires, um, I think he has like 230 sleep resist or something like that. 
And so, you know, one sleep pod will do that easily. And then the second time you put him to sleep, it costs like, uh, it requires 240 sleep buildup. And then the third time it requires like 350, right? And so each time you put him to sleep or, you know, uh, trigger a status effect on him. So this also includes like bleed or poison and frostbite. Every time you trigger a status effect on an enemy, their resistance to that status effect grows. So you see like the first couple times I want to put him to sleep, it only takes one sleep pot. But then after that, it starts taking two or three of them to put him to sleep because his resistance grows. So you also need a whole bunch of sleep pots for this fight if you want to be able to consistently put him to sleep, which is another reason why I don't like having to use the sleep pots. But again, with that said, you see it. So I just back off. I hit him with the sleep pots and then, oh, here I baited out his atomic ass blast instead of letting him do the, uh, the pinwheel world roller attack. Um, but yeah, so I just hit him with a sleep pot, let him fall asleep. And then once he's asleep, I hit him with a couple Impaling Thrusts. I think here I did a Charge R2, and then I did a couple Impaling Thrusts. And the Impaling Thrusts break his stance, and so I get a repost. And so I'm just taking off a whole bunch of his health, you know, with each hit. And, you know, if I had, like, a, a bleed weapon, like, um, uh, uh, Flamberge, the greatsword that has built-in bleed, um, or even something like the Pole Blade or something like that, um, I would be doing way more damage to him with the bleed, because he's really weak to bleed. But yeah, so sleep pots make this fight kind of trivial, but it also, you know, sleep pots are really inconsistent because you really have no good way of getting an infinite amount of them unless you have a friend to, you know, duplicate them for you or something like that. Um, and, you know, if you want to do that, that's entirely up to you. Personally, I've never done it. It's not something I have an interest in, in doing, but, you know, if you have someone that can drop you stuff or I think there's a subreddit called Patches Trading Emporium or something like that. Um, where you can get other people to give you stuff, uh, you know, then feel free to do that, you know, if you if it's what you find fun in the game. I totally understand it being shitty to fight this boss without sleep pots, and it's shitty that you can't farm the material to make sleep pots. Um, I think that's kind of a bad design. And it's like, okay, like, I'm in rant mode right now, obviously, because I just kind of need to fill up this clip with audio. Um, but... It is kind of a flaw in this game's design that so many items have such low drop rates. Trina Zillies from the, the Clean Rot Knights that dropped them have like a 3% drop rate. That's obscenely low. Okay, rant time is done. So however you decide to kill the Godskin Noble, after the fight we're going to take the elevator up and then we're going to come into the second half of Volcano Manor. So there's a somber smithing stone 6 that we're going to grab over here past this Virgin Abductor. So again, um, if you are not a New Game Plus, then this lava will make you run really slow. I'm looking up at this ledge up here because you can actually get up there and then drop down to here instead of running across the lava. Um, but for me, it was more convenient to just run across the lava. But anyway, so you go around the corner and you'll see there's a room down here. And then inside the room, uh, there's a somber smithing stone 6 that is guarded by a bunch of basilisks. So the basilisk can insta-kill you if they fill up your death bite meter, so be careful of that. Um, but they're not hard to deal with. And then after that, there's this room over here uh, that has a ladder that takes you back up to where you need to go to get to the next part of the manor. Um, alternatively, if you don't want to run across the lava, instead of running past the Virgin Abductor, uh, you can come through this window here and be careful because it can attack you through the wall. Um, there's an elevator there. That's a shortcut that takes you back down to the Temple of Igle. Uh, and then you'll see here on the left is where that ladder was. And on the right is where you can drop down to get to the somber stone uh, that we just picked up. After that, we're going to keep heading through the manor. In this room, we're going to make a left, and we're going to go back up these stairs, and there's this uh, imp statue. You need two stone sword keys for that, so keep that in mind. That brings us into this big sex dungeon room, whatever you want to call it. And instead of jumping onto the cages, we're going to come to the right over here after the doorway, and we're going to drop down onto this lower ledge. And then there's a little secret side path here. There's a couple enemies here. You can fight them, whatever. Uh, on this ledge, there is the dagger talisman, so that increases the damage you do with critical hits. Um, so that's definitely worth grabbing. And there's also a rune arc on this corpse over here. Um, and then, you know, murder this old crippled Alban arc. Gotta say, I really love this critical animation. It just makes me feel so powerful, you know, like I'm not the one being bullied in high school again. Uh, anyway, so we're gonna jump down onto the cages here. So this room down here is filled with Alban arcs that can grab you, um, and they do a fuckload of damage when they grab you, so be careful of these guys. If you head to the west, then when you come up the staircase out here, there's a virgin abductor, and on the corpse behind it is a somber stone 7, so that's what we're here for. 
So make sure you grab that. And then if you head the other way, there's this fireplace room, uh, and this has a doorway that leads back out to the uh, main room of Volcano Manor. Now we're going to head over to the Dragon Barrow to grab a Somberstone 8 and a Somberstone 9 by the Divine Tower of Kaelid. So there's a couple ways you can get over here. Um, you could come from Fort Far Off because we already have that side of Grace. And then just from Fort Far Off, you just follow the road to the west and that takes you over here. Um, alternatively, if you come in from Kaelid uh, over here by the Kaelin Ruins and, you know, you follow the road uh, until you see the canyon to the east. And at the north end of the canyon, you can jump across and be over here in the Dragon Barrow. And then after that, it's just a straight shot over to Divine Tower of Kaelid, like 20 feet away. First, we're going to kill this Scarab. So this Scarab will drop the Somberstone 8. Um, be careful of it because it explodes on death. But it drops a Somber Smithing Stone 8. And then we're going to head just around the corner down here. There's a circle of chairs uh, and one of the corpses has a Somber Stone 9. And a plus 9 Somber weapon is going to be super strong. So you can end there, you know, uh, if you don't want to have to do this next part. So the easiest Somber Stone 10 that we can get, also called an Ancient Dragon Somber Smithing Stone, um, is in the Mogwin Palace. So we can get here in a few different ways. Um, the easiest way to do it is by doing White Mask Vare's questline. He's the guy that you meet at the first step. Um, I have a whole video about how to get to Mogwin Palace, so I'm going to link that in the description below um, because this video is already long enough as it is and I, I don't want to draw it out any longer than it has to be. Um, it is a bit of a process, but... Uh, like I said, a plus 9 somber weapon will easily get you through the entire game. So if you don't end up getting this one until like later on, uh, you know, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. I promise. Uh, but if you do, so we're going to come up here. Once we get past the Mogwin Dynasty Mausoleum Midpoint, we're going to come over to where this Sanguine Noble is. Uh, you're going to need cookeries for this. Uh, and then it's also nice if you have a bow to help you aim. So that's why I'm equipping. So you aim at that pillar that's over there on the other side of him. And then you just tap X to throw a Kukri. The Kukri makes a really loud noise that attracts the attention of enemies for a long time. So while he's distracted, we're going to run up and inside this chest is the Somber Smithing Stone. So grab it and run away before you die. And that concludes this guide. Your plus 10 Eleonora's Pole Blade will shred pretty much anything, especially if it's vulnerable to bleed. Um, enemies like imps or gargoyles, you know, things that can't bleed are going to be a lot more resistant to it. But it is a pretty strong weapon, so, you know, have fun using it. If you found this helpful, please leave a like and consider subscribing. Uh, comment any questions or feedback you have down below, and I'll catch you later.